Hi, welcome to Time Limit, and thanks so much for listening. I'm your host, Brett Harned, and I'm just going to jump in and tell you that I'm pretty excited about this episode. My guests are Rich Maltzman and Jim Stewart, and they just co-authored a really helpful book called How to Facilitate Productive Project Planning Meetings. I read the book within a couple of days and found myself nodding in agreement most of the time I was reading. But I also found some really helpful new tactics to use in meetings, which is awesome. That alone told me that I needed to get these guys on the show as soon as possible. Both of them have really amazing resumes, and both have taught project management at respected universities. And Rich is the co-author of PMI's Cleveland award-winning Green Project Management, so that's another one to check out. These guys are serious PMPs with an interesting and unique point of view about project management with a side of dad humor, which is a perfect match for me. So give it a listen. Hey, Rich and Jim, thanks so much for joining me on Time Limit today. How are you guys doing? Good. Doing well, thanks. Awesome. Great to be here. Good. Well, thanks so much for writing How to Facilitate Productive Project Planning Meetings. It's a really good book, and I think it's full of really good advice and tips and tactics, and I love the war stories part, too. It's, It's really great. I'm curious, how did you guys come together to write the book? Let me take that one if I can, Brett. So uh, as a project manager of some years, I've been doing projects. Uh, my background is IT, but I've been doing pharmaceutical projects with a customer who hired me to come in and do them. We ran a lot of these big uh, two-day meetings. And after a number of years of doing that, I went to a colleague of mine. I said, I'm trying to think of writing a book. He said, you know those meetings you do? I'd read that. So, oh, okay. And I have known Rich for a number of years, and he'd been writing books with other people. I said, Rich, how about if we write a book? And he said, I described it to him. He said, yeah, good idea. So I'll take credit for that, but I will give cre- credit to Rich for doggedly pursuing a, uh, a publisher. So that's how that came about. Yeah, that makes sense. I th- the idea of writing a book is always a daunting one, but right. writing a book with a partner sounds like a great idea. Was that a, how was your kind of process for that? Well, I'll, I'll pipe in there. Jim, Jim actually. Actually, acted kind of as the project manager. Um, uh, we, well, I do some teaching, and in, in teaching project management at the graduate level, I use the analogy that a, a project manager is kind of like the uh, producer, you know, getting things getting things out, and the director um, has um, a different role. And the, Jim kind of acted as the, the the director, making sure that I wasn't being too artistic and wanting to put more and more into the book. And actually, I think I have those roles reversed. Jim was really the director of project manager. I was the producer who wants to make the scene perfect. And uh, Jim would say, Rich, it's, you know, done is better than perfect, which is an excellent saying for project managers. Rich wanted to do the rock opera, and I just wanted like a three-minute song. So we we came somewhere in the middle. That's right. (laughs) I I would say that's a great analogy. Right. And I love that you used done is better than perfect because we use that very often at Team Gantt. You know, it's like this idea of producing something you're really excited about, not letting it kind of drag you down into the, the nitty gritty at first and then just kind of seeing where it takes you, which. And, and yes, and every book I've done, I have done with someone else. And in almost every case, they have to take me out back and, and uh, <laughs> shoot me or the book won't get out. And that's what Jim was, was very, very good at. Besides the content. Yeah, no, the content is great. And and really, the the, the book kind of it, it focuses in a couple of areas, but really it feels like meetings is like really the kind of meat of it. But I'd love to kind of start and just kind of talk about plans because, you know, obviously our audience are mostly people who are leading projects, leading teams, and creating plans is something that they're doing as, as a part of Team Gantt. So I'm curious from your points of view, uh, maybe if I could start with Jim, what do you think the barriers that PMs uh, face in terms of creating plans? Oh, really good question. So as you know, both Rich and I teach. We teach a lot of PMP and other things. And when I uh, and the project management body of knowledge has a lot of 24-some processes and planning. So I say to students, there's a message being sent. And I ask them, I, I do my own informal polls. This is great about having students. What prevents you from planning? Well, one of the things is some of them don't really even know they have to plan. They probably spend more time planning their vacations than they do a project. But it's also that management won't allow them time to do it. I'll, I'll just end this and, and I'll turn it over to Rich on this. I have a book that showed two pictures, cartoons. One is the, 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 the guy, the project manager who's sitting and planning, and the other guy's got fires going. Well, management likes the guy that fires going because something's happening. 
He's setting his own fires and putting them out. Well, the guy's planning. What is planning? What's he actually doing? What am I paying him for? So it's not an understanding of, say, management or even project managers that they have to plan. And then they never are given enough time. So Rich and I make that point in the book. And the fact you'll eventually have to plan. And it's worse if you do it during execution. So I, I think it's a function of culture. I think it's a function of time. Yep. I agree. I I think also that uh, when I hear that question, what barriers do you face as PMs when you're creating plans? The biggest one is the reason we wrote the book. Uh, You need meetings. Like them, hate them, love them, regret them. (laughs) You end up needing meetings. So if you're going to plan, you need to do it as a group. You can't do it sitting by yourself in a cube or uh, at a desk, Um, especially these days where you're remotely located. Plans require meetings because projects require people and those people have to be together. Um, So one of the biggest barriers for creating a plan is the fact that you darn well have to have a meeting and we're there to try to help make the meeting a little bit more compelling, a little bit more meaningful and more helpful towards the plan. And it's a pleasant surprise when it's run well. Rich and I know, and you probably know as well, Brett, that people hate to go to meetings in part because they're so poorly run. If they go to one where there's uh, well run, they go, oh, this guy knows what's going on. It's, it's, as if you, it's as if you had to go to a, you know, you found out your nephew was doing a music recital. So I got to go see him. And the guy plays guitar like Eric Clapton. You go, wow, this guy is great. Same thing with the meeting. These guys are good at running a meeting. It's, it's worthwhile coming to. So we're trying to get people to not only appreciate meetings, but run them so people want to come to them. I totally agree. Everything that you guys are saying, I'm sitting here nodding my head like crazy because there are so many barriers, I think, in place for a project manager to actually get in there and start getting the job done and preparing themselves for a lot of things that could happen or even go wrong on a project. And I know in my experience, you know, a big problem with trying to come up with a, a an actual timeline or a project plan um, early on in the project is you just don't have enough information. And a lot of times I, I can remember putting plans together and they'd be done piecemeal because... I'd be relying on information from the team on, you know, tasks that they think thought that needed to get done or different ways of approaching a problem and then talking to the stakeholders about the ways that they can impact the project and any barriers that they might kind of put in place. And it can be really hard to get the attention of those people because they're busy and often at the early planning stages of a project, they're busy working on something else. So I'm curious if you, either of you, have any recommendations on how a PM can really like work to engage both the team and stakeholders to get those details early on so that they can actually create an accurate plan or a close to accurate plan. You want to take that one, Richard? Sure. Um, I think that the key to a successful project and putting our book aside for just a moment, as painful as that is, um, the, the project has to be properly chartered. And, and you don't necessarily have to have a three-page, you know, ex- precisely formatted project charter format. But it, when I say chartered, I mean authorized by senior management so that people are, you're getting their attention because, oh, you're working on project R. <laughs> I want to be in that. So um, you need the project to be properly chartered. And, and as far as getting people's attention, that's the key words here. How do you get people's attentions? Because that's going to determine whether they come to your meeting, whether they pay attention, whether they're going to be a cynic in the back going, oh, this is never going to work. Right. Um, um, to bring them in in with a proper attitude, you need to show them what's in it for them, whether that's just making sure their input is listened to at the beginning or whether they get to see what the project's outcome is going to mean for their, for themselves personally, their career path, their organization. You really have to almost put yourself in the moccasins, sandals, shoes, Birkenstocks of your um, potential stakeholders and say, okay, I'm now the installation manager. What is this person you know, Karen, what is she going to want to get out of this meeting? So um, it's two, those two things would be my piece here. Properly chartering the project and author, authorization, recognition from senior management that this is real, this is an important project, tied to the str- strategic goals of the company, hopefully, um, or the nonprofit, and what's in it for your attendees and making that clear to them as you invite them to a kickoff meeting, let's say. And I would add one thing, which is say, because people may have five projects that meet Rich's criteria, 
the, the other thing has to be, where does this fit in the priority of things? Because people in organizations, organization I'm working at now, everything is priority one. So what happens is the people who want to prioritize the projects are the workers. And they say, OK, if management won't give me direction, I will decide my priorities. So when Rich and I come to them as project managers, they say, OK, which of these other five should I give up? So if I really want mine to, you know, uh, to succeed, I have to get management to say, this is your higher priority one. Some things aren't entirely under our control. We, we have to stop pretending as project managers that if we're good guys and show up, everything will happen. We need sponsorship and we need senior management to get behind our projects and make sure it's the high priority one that they really want to get done. And that'll, that'll help. Otherwise, if we're the fifth priority, I don't care how swell we are. It's not going to happen. That's so true. So, Rich, I know you put the book aside for a minute. I'm going to bring it back on the table. Um, please, please do. <laughs> <laughs> so the book offers some really direct and easy to implement guidance on how to facilitate project meetings, like uh, meetings of all types. And I know it's probably not easy for you to name just one of these, but do you have a go-to facilitation tactic that you think can help someone who's in any kind of meeting scenario? I, I do, and I think it's a pretty straightforward and easy to implement one, and just often overlooked. And people say, oh, we're going to parking lot that. So that means to take the idea that's being discussed, it seems a little off, uh, it looks, it's, it's a new thread, it's going to divert the meeting. The simple idea of physically getting a flip chart, and there's not, nothing wrong with, you know, we're so used to Facebook and social media and, and everything on a screen, there's nothing wrong with, and I'd say there's everything right with, the feel, the sound, the touch of paper um, in a meeting room. So you post a piece of paper and at the beginning, a uh, flip chart, or if you have a whiteboard, that's fine. And you say, you know, we're going to you reserve this spot. So if someone wants to, someone has a great idea, we don't want to lose it, uh, I'm going to write it down on that board or maybe even invite them to write it down. So this simple idea of a flip chart, or here we're in New England, so I'll say it properly, flip chat. <laughs> um, that you use as a as a uh, ground rule at the beginning of the meeting. It's clear, clear to everyone that you know I have an idea, and I know this could divert the meeting. And some people have that power trip where they want to divert the meeting, which is going to our goblins, which we can talk about. But the the fact that you can upend that behavior by saying, um, "Here's a place to record these things." They will get attention after the meeting. Um, we'll send copies, you know, maybe even photos these days. You can take a picture of that to everyone um, so that this is followed up on. So that's my that's my one simple facilitation technique. And my, mine would be not a technique so much as a mindset. If you're having a meeting, whether it's a half hour or an hour or a half a day, keep your goal in mind. Because what happens is if you say to yourself, okay, within this morning, we're going to have this discussion, this decision, and these two artifacts, that keeps you focused. You don't have to worry about where you're spending your time. If Joe or Mary are sidetracking the meeting, you can say to yourself, okay, I've just lost 10 minutes to these goals I have. Now, of course, you don't have to be stupid about it. You might say, somebody else might say, those things that Joe and Mary brought up are maybe are more important than what we had planned to do. And so you go with that. But if they're not, you have to keep your focus in mind, your goal in mind, and make sure that you're getting to those goals. Otherwise, What's happened, and the book is all about this, not letting other people hijack your meeting. So that by the time you leave, after an hour or two or whatever, you've got one of your four goals done. You had a lot of pleasant conversation. All that's happened to people has had some coffee and donuts, and you didn't get to your goal. So keep your goal in mind so you're focused. Yeah, I love that. And I really, I actually had prepared a question about this, and you've already mentioned it a couple times. I love the meeting goblins section of the book. Um, and I think it's probably because we've all either been the goblin or have been in situations where we have to handle the goblin. Um, that person tries to kind of take over. And I think you offer some really good advice in the book about how to minimize bad meeting behavior, even just supported by what you were just talking about, Jim. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you could set expectations going into a meeting to maybe get ahead of some of those issues and kind of squashing them before you get in a room together. I'd like to turn that one over to Rich because he created the goblin thing and maybe we could start it and I can Great. tackle it at the end. Perfect. Sure. Sure. And I'm not going to jump right into the goblins because it's like any, you know, since they're goblins, any suspense thriller type movie, you have to build up to their appearance. They don't just jump out at the beginning of the movie. <laughs> so you have to have some suspense. So I would say, because to answer your question, Brett, directly about um, setting expectations, uh, this may come up in another question or uh, in our conversation later, but the key is 
preparation, right? Planning for the meetings. I mean, ironically, a lot of these planning meetings are about planning a very well directed project, but often not a lot of time or preparation goes into planning for the meetings. And that's kind of the, the setup for the goblins and the setup, a big part of our, our book. To that end, homework, and I know it's a dreaded word. Well, I'll just say work done before the meeting is not something that's going to cause brain damage. In fact, it will help the um, prevent a lot of this goblin-esque, is that a word? Goblin-esque behavior. Now it's a so, word. <laughs> now it's a word. Yeah. Uh, trademark by Jim and Rich. Um, so, for example, um, if everyone should have read um, uh, something about, uh, let's say this is an architectural project, and they should re have read um, about the plot plan and the local area and the demographics of the customers in that area before they come to the meeting, and it takes 15 minutes. Having 12 people spend 15 minutes before is going to save you all kinds of confusion, side conversations, and again, goblin-esque behavior, because people are saying, well, wait, why, is it, why are we building this here? Well, you know why we're building it here. It's in the second paragraph of the reading that I asked you to do before. And, you know, it's a little bit like homework in that if it's done well, you'll do better in the class. In this case, better in the in the meeting. Um, as to the goblins, we have all kinds of them. The book has a section on this. Um, our talks since we've written the book have become even more, what's the right word, flowery, <laughs> um, elaborative on this. Um, but just as an example, sometimes you just have a couple of people who are talking to each other in the back. You know, Mary and Kim, they're just talking to each other in the back. And, and this is a trick I actually learned from my daughter who teaches middle school. You just use what she calls macro body language. Instead of gesturing with arms and legs, face, facial expressions, she just slowly walks over to their area and stands near them. <laughs> and literally just approaching them. You don't say anything. They're like, why is he standing there? Well, he's standing there because I'm trying to get you to stop talking. And it works like a charm. So that's an example of one of the solutions to one of the goblins, uh, which I think is, uh, I can't even remember the name of that one, but uh, um, it, it, it's, it's, uh, there's a whole array of bad behavior at meetings, and we use these goblins to have a fun way to describe what, what has really been described to us by dozens of people. And we did research this, not just from Rich Maltzman and Jim Stewart's um, massive <laughs> experience in attending meetings, but you know, we talked to many, 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 many project management colleagues and got war stories from them. So you said you liked the war stories part. The war stories yielded the goblins. Okay. And, and, and if I can take off on one of the other more difficult, I think challenging goblins, we have one called Nasty's Naysayer. Now, I don't remember if I mentioned this in a book or not, but I mentioned in meetings, there's a guy in every company. His job is to go into every meeting, fold his arms and say, it won't work. And then he goes home to his wife at night, and she says, what did you do today, honey? He says, I folded my arms and told five different projects they wouldn't work. So you get it. I'm kidding. But by the same token, how do you deal with this guy or this gal? Somebody asked me that in a session. Well, I think, first of all, we understand that maybe there's an issue with him, the way he has whatever caused him to be that way or her that way. But I think there has to be, rather than a condom, there has to be an understanding and acceptance that Joe is always like this. We get it. Everybody in the company knows he's like this. So what do we do? The worst thing I think we can do is to is to bring him down. We've got to somehow. Joe brings up something. This will never work. I might say, "Hey, everybody." Joe says, "This will never work." What do you think? Is this worth servicing? Now we talk about it, and they say, "Well, it's worth a try," et cetera. And we're listening to Joe. We're hearing Joe out. We know he's an nasty naysayer, but we're hearing him out. Listen to what he says. He's re, he's saving face a little bit. He's not being dissed. He's not being disregarded. And we're discussing it. He might even turn around a little bit. If he does this continually, we have to find other measures to deal with it, whether it's more discussion and more of that where people start turning him off. And the worst case where I've seen, maybe in the afternoon session, Joe isn't there anymore. He's got to play by the rules. But I think the important thing is not to somehow, oh, Joe, you know what you're talking about. You always say that. Treat him with respect. Understand where he's coming from. You might even convert him. Who knows? To some level. So I wanted to bring that one up. And I, I want to add to this. It's actually kind of important. It's it's perhaps a little bit more into the generic field of project management, but it does tie back to the meetings. If you've got, I think we call her Nancy Naysayer in your meeting, um, you could also think of this, and this is aging me a bit, but you could also think of Debbie Downer from SNL Saturday Night Live. <laughs> yep. I, don't, I don't remember that. Oh, I do. Yep. Uh, this is a person you relish, you really want 
during your risk identification, your, especially your threat identification, because mm-hmm. Debbie Downer is going to say, wah, 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 that won't work, <laughs> this won't work. Right. And each time she speaks, she's identifying threats. And culturally, there's an interesting cultural thing here because I had two years in the Netherlands. One of the things I noticed about Northern Europe is they have this easy to switch mindset where they can turn into pessimists and identify threat and then switch back to being optimists and get on with the project. As an American, we're eternal optimists and we tend to think of negative comments as, you know, Debbie Downers, as people right. who are who are, are considered naysayers and, and um, ne'er-do-wells. And yet you need them at this point. So um, I, I think it's, it's, uh, interesting to note that from my experience in uh, the Netherlands, the two years there, they could uh, they could sit there and say, this project w- won't work because this, this, and this. And then they'd say, okay, let's go get some snacks or beer. <laughs> let's go let's go start this project. I can't wait to get started. And Americans are going, oh, my God, I'm so depressed. You know? <laughs> we take everything and personally and we on take some it level, personally. right? We, we, t- we look at the, all those negative comments as, you know, uh, anti-optimistic when they're actually focused threat identification. So you can you can say to this person at the meeting, and I think we mentioned this in the book, you can say, your input is going to be exceedingly valuable um, when we get to threat identification. So hold that thought. Yeah, I think what you're saying is, you know, project management or leadership requires empathy, right? Like you can't take everything at face value. You have to put yourself in, in someone else's shoes. And if you're not doing that, you're not doing it right, right? That's right. That's a huge part. And I hope and I think I can even affect because I'll be in the seventh edition uh, review team for the PIMBOK guide that that emotional intelligence and and psychology and even neuroscience um, will wor- worm its way, maybe work its way. I'm not sure the end of that word work. I think work its way sounds better <laughs> into <laughs> the PIMBOK guide um, more than just Appendix X, which I think it is right now. Yeah. It's just this little short appendix on on uh, emotional intelligence and leadership skills and so-called soft skills. Is it's very scientific. It's there's much more science to this than people think, and I think I can tell from your attitude, Brett, and I know Jim, that it's a huge portion of a good project manager's work. I agree, and there's not enough um, discussion or education around it at this point. So I'm really glad to hear that it's going to worm or work its way into the pinbox because I think that's really important. It's really, you know, social skills. Soft skills, empathy is really, in my opinion, a big part of being an effective project manager and a likable one at the same time. Yes. And Uh, that's an underpinning concept in our book. So we didn't write it that way. We didn't want to scare people away and write a book on neuroscience. No, we wrote a book on how very how to book, how to Mm -hmm. run a a productive project planning meeting. But the underpinnings of it are exactly what we're talking about right now. I agree. I I definitely picked up on that. And I'm picking up on that just in this conversation. I think another theme we're kind of touching on here there is when you take the time to do proper planning and preparation, you save time later. So while to a PM it might feel, or even an executive, it might feel like it's taking too long to pull this plan together or timeline together. Really, if you aren't taking that time to do it early on, you're going to waste time later on because it's not going to be effective in helping you to manage the project. And I think another theme that I kind of want to touch on there is Preparing for remote meetings. So for our listeners' sake, we just had an experience leading up to this recording where there was a problem, a challenge with the calendar invite that I sent. Then there was a little confusion over getting into Skype and how we would record. And we started about 15 minutes early, and we actually ended up starting recording about five minutes early because we met early and resolved the issues together. And to me, that's that's a thing. So I usually have that time baked into these recordings, but it's a good thing to think about. Like, what are the things that you need to take into consideration when you're preparing for or moderating a meeting? And what? I think when you're doing it remotely, that adds another level. So I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts on that. Let me jump in on that one. I'm sure Rich can buttress it. We actually have a chapter in the book, a guy named Wayne Termel, is it, Rich? Yeah, Wayne- Termel. Yep. Termel. Wayne Termel, and he wrote a whole chapter for us on a uh, virtual uh, setup. There's two pieces to what you said. The virtual implies technology. And I, I've talked about, maybe it's in the book again, I can't remember, 
I've gone to meetings where there were in-person meetings and something like my wireless mouse wouldn't work. So people in the meeting were spending 15 minutes trying to fix that wireless mouse. So I'd say, forget the wireless mouse. You know, we're going to just get down to the meeting. So I say, we say in the book, you know, make sure the technology works in advance, have the gotchas, have the IT people ready. You know, we all know how to use Skype and WebEx and everything by now. But, you know, we learned something about recording just before we came on the call. So know the technology, have backup technology if you can. Uh, make sure that you know how to use the technology that generally speaking works uh, and then and then have that and then know what the right technology is to use. For example, one of the things that Rich and I talk about in the book is doing a work breakdown structure across the virtual connection. And when I've done that before, it's been sort of a hit or miss, hold the camera up to here and there. Well, I just found out the other day that Microsoft, haven't used it yet, so I'm not promoting it. Microsoft has a product called Mural, M-U-R-A-L. Somebody told me about it, one of my one of my friends slash colleagues, and he said, it's great. You bring your up on both sides. You have, like, virtual sticky notes you can move around. So now that you can do something like that, now you've got the technology. It's working. Everybody's engaged. You can share things. So I think it's first making sure the technology works, and if you have a backup, if it doesn't, you're not just sort of wringing your hands, or you have IT people you can call. Can call. Secondly, knowing, as always, the right tool for the job. If you're just going to share screens, WebEx or Skype might be fine. But if you're actually going to be functioning across the screens, you need a mural or some other tool that will allow you to communicate across that with the understanding that it can be perfect. So that's that's my thought on it. Absolutely. Right. Let me just let me just add the name of the book. Um, it's by the author's Wayne Termell, and it's uh, the Long Distance Leader, and uh, I think that's the, t the full title. And um, or becoming a long distance leader. We'll provide, of course, a, a link for you. And we want to thank Wayne for helping us because that's that's his area of expertise, and that's one of the other principles here. If someone knows stuff better than you. Defer. Yeah. Defer. Hand off. You don't need to be in charge of everything. That's great. It's really good advice that I think a lot of people unfortunately don't take. Uh, I think a lot of times project managers feel like they need to be the end all be all or they won't look good. <laughs> and exactly. that's, that's truly not the case. You look better when you hand off someone something to someone who's actually a specialist. Yes. All right. So we are coming up uh, on on our time limit, which is the title of the podcast. And it's kind of you know giving a nod to the fact that everybody's working under some kind of constraints, right? right? And it can definitely be true for project managers who are working on multiple projects with multiple team members in various locations and then stakeholders on top of that. And I think PMs are often, we already talked about this in the beginning, like pressured to deliver a plan quickly. So oh. sometimes conducting the meetings that you might be recommending and getting full buy-in isn't always an option. So what kind of advice do you have for folks who are put under that pressure? Jeez, uh, let me think about that. I think, I think one of the things that I've suggested is, and I hate to suggest this, the ideal way to do any kind of planning is as a group with your team. You know, put the schedule together, put the risk register together. If you have a really limited amount of time and you can't get people together, I'm okay with the idea of you as a project manager doing a straw man of it. But the straw man can't be the end all and the be all. I have a schedule, let's say a Gantt chart, a Microsoft project, for example. We're talking waterfall, my initial risk register, and then socialize that. Get that going. Hey, guys, gal, this is a draft. Let's get on the phone and discuss it. It gives them a starting place to do that. So you're still kind of doing it, but you're not necessarily doing it from zero. You're doing it 50 or 60%. Or if you can, we have a second version of the meeting, which is like a one-day version of the meeting. But somebody somewhere has to do some planning. You can't say, we can't all get together, therefore there's no planning. So I think it's incumbent upon the project manager to say, I will do some, but here's the important point. I will socialize with you so that there's buy-in. And if, if you don't get five days, if you get three days, if you get two days, if you get a half day, it's better than just saying, we won't do any at all. Completely agree. And you know, that's been my process is to start with maybe even just a sketch. Maybe it's right. not Maybe it's not a, a full Gantt chart. Maybe it's just an right. outline of, here's what I think we need to deliver. Here are the, the risks that we need to account for. Here's right. the resourcing challenges. And then start a discussion about what the plan will be. I, so, I find that that buys um, accountability, which can often be a problem on projects. You know, when you give right. the team an idea and you start a discussion about how you'll work together, um, it gets them engaged on a different level than saying, like, here's a plan, let's walk through it together. Um, Jim, curious if you have any thoughts here. I don't want to eat up your time. Um, well, that was rich. I mean, 
Oh, I'm sorry. That, yeah, that was Jim. Uh, so, Jim, do you have any more? No. Um, <laughs> well, I would say that I would go back to the idea. That I, so I agree with this idea of um, kind of parsing out the planning by starting with a, a straw man. And I would go back to the idea that in this case, you really, you really even more have to rely on some work. So you okay. send people the full, um, the full rational rationale for the project, the background, and your straw straw person and ask, you know, ask them to critique it. And sometimes it's true. People do better at picking apart uh, a proposed idea than starting from scratch. But uh, I'll close my, my section here by saying nothing beats um, a, a well-run, um, well-thought-out, planned meeting. Because in real time, when brains are working together, um, it, there's, there's strength in that versus, dis, versus you know, cubicles and emails and texts. For sure. There's also a little psychological game I can play within that, which is the following. I might go into a room and say, oh, we're going to create a work breakdown structure with a bunch of stickies. I don't want to do that. So I go, okay, I'll put up my version of the WBS, how it should look. Does that look good to you guys? No, that's all wrong. Why don't you come up and show me how it should look? And I stand back and I take notes. So I guess I tricked them a little bit, but hopefully in a good way to say, okay, fix it for me. I think kind of Richard's kind of alluding to that. Okay, if I've done it wrong here, you, and then they get engaged. One right. way or the other, they get engaged and they fix it and they do it right. So and you're back, that's you're a way to, to exp- that's a way to expedite people into into um, the planning phase. So if when you are pressed for time, that uh, that is an excellent trick. I've used it myself. Yeah. Good. I'm glad to hear. We're definitely all on the same page there, and that's some of the stuff that I talk about in our planning webinars at Team Gantt. So good to hear that that I'm not saying things that are terribly off base with with the well-known PMs of the world. So wondering if there are any other resources, you know, like books, classes, podcasts you want to share with our listeners or even any parting thoughts before we uh, we take off? Go ahead, Jim. Uh, I wish I could tell you books, this and that besides ours. I We had a hard time finding a good one, just part of why we read it. Uh I, I'm drawing a blank on, on – you go ahead, Rich, and I'll think of something. Yeah, but I, sure. I, can't I, would say, I would say, you know, in our book, we have a list of references mm-hmm. from which we drew. Um, so the idea of our book is facilitating project planning meetings, and that's a subset to some extent – um, I think there's some things that aren't in, in these books, but there, it's a subset of general facilitation. And we did find some uh, folks who were uh, outstanding at that, just general, you know, whatever meetings, you know, facilitation of meetings. And so we did draw from them. And I think that's a broader base of knowledge to go to. And, and the, um, the set of references we provide in the book would, uh, would be what I would reiterate in terms of uh, resources. Great. That's a good that's a good point. If people don't know how to facilitate a meeting, let's say it's a full day meeting, better that they bring somebody in or don't do it at all than have a lousy facilitation. Because as I said before, in the book or otherwise, if you're bringing people in for an all day meeting and you can't run that meeting, they look at you and think, this guy's going to run my project. So you better get good at facilitation or bring in an experienced facilitator or else it's, it's just going to all go south. All right. Yep. Well, thank you so much for joining me on Time Limit. I really appreciate it. And I hope I've really enjoyed this conversation. I hope we get to talk again soon. Sure. I absolutely. Too. Excellent. Thank you very much Brett, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. I'll say it again, but I was so happy to hear that everything we're teaching about project leadership at Team Gantt is in line with what the folks who are connected to PMI are teaching. It was especially exciting to hear that PMI will be including content about EQ and soft skills in its curriculum. That's a theme that's central to what I've been teaching in our weekly live classes and in the Art and Science of Leading Projects, which is a video course. Those classes and the Art and Science of Leading Projects are all completely free, so I hope you'll check them out at teamgant.com or even on YouTube. So that's all for this episode. Check out our website for show notes, Rich and Jim's bios, and a link to their book, as well as a bunch of other great resources. If you're liking the show, please give us a thumbs up where you listen to your podcasts and share with your friends and colleagues as much as you can. We'll be back for episode 18 with Suze Howarth to talk about crafting your own process. Thanks. Thanks.